morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out so early, and thank you for starting precisely on time. I find that quite unusual and quite impressive. <laughs> you know, it's a, um, there's been a lot of discussion in Washington. I think some of you know that there's been this three-day academic conference on the legacy of the Vietnam War going on that just ended yesterday afternoon and starting last night, a two-day conference on uh, the lessons of Vietnam and the lessons for the anti-war movement, which looking around the room, I see that most people here were part of that movement. <laughs> <laughs> which is a good thing and a challenge to us all. Um, but in, that, in the context of those conferences, there's been a lot of talk about church basements. And a lot of people there were saying, you know, we spend a lot of time in church basements. And I'm on the road a lot. I spend a lot of time in church basements. And I love church basements. It's, you know, it's kind of where I feel the most at home. It's, it's where we do the best work. It's where we do the important work of figuring out where to go and what to do next. And eventually, somebody said, and you know, sometimes they even graduate up to the pulpit upstairs. You know, the, the main conference last night, uh, at the, the um, New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in, in D.C. Uh, was in the big, uh, the big par what is it called, the main sanctuary. The main sanctuary, sorry. Yes, the main sanctuary. And somebody referred to that and said, you know, sometimes we graduate to the main, uh, the main hall in the sanctuary. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but the real work goes on in the basement. So I'm glad to be spending the morning with you in the, in the church basement. Uh, it's also a day of, if not celebration, at least of relief. Um, that a bit of justice may be at hand with the indictment of the six uh, police officers who clearly had some role in the, uh, in the murder of Freddie Gray. And it's not, it's not an answer, as we just heard from the pastor here. This isn't, this isn't the answer. Systemic change is what's needed. He's absolutely right. But the notion that accountability can be a starting point is a powerful one. And I know that the, the protest that's, that's planned for later today is being now turned into a, a sense of celebration that some modicum of justice may be possible. So I think that's a very important, um, a very important moment. In recent years in this country, both those of us who focus primarily on the wars abroad, on, on our foreign policy, the consequences for U.S. policy to people around the world, I think we've had a pretty crummy few years. There hasn't been a lot to celebrate. After a very hopeful time with the election of the anti-war president, whom we all celebrated as part of the victory against racism. That was real. That was an incredible achievement. That nothing that Barack Obama does can take that away. But the notion that Barack Obama was going to be a transformational president has proved not true. The notion that he was going to be an anti-war president, somehow deserving of that way premature Nobel Peace Prize, has turned out to be not just premature, but way more. And that's been hard to come to terms with. It's been hard to come to terms with. And, <coughs> sorry, speaking on behalf of frogs everywhere, I'm sorry for sounding like a frog. Uh, the, the notion that what we do to challenge wars can be done the same way that we always did it, we started to realize, no, we can't. We have to do things differently. We have to do things differently. We, we got that. And now we're, in a sense, experiment to see what's it going to take? What's it going to take to do things differently? We're in a different political moment. It's not a better or worse moment. Arguably, for people in the, in the wider Middle East, it's a worse moment. Uh, because... It's a worse moment because what we are seeing is the expansion of a war that is too easy to hide back here at home. So we no longer have 150,000 ground troops in Iraq. That's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a really, really good thing. That was a victory, not least, of people in this room. 
that the Obama administration that desperately wanted to keep troops in Iraq and had a big problem with the Iraqi parliament and, and leader who were about to give them immunity for US troops committing war crimes. And instead of saying, you know what, we're going to make sure they don't commit war crimes, what a concept. Instead they said, okay, if we can't have immunity, we're not going to keep them there. But it was also because of the work of the anti-war movement that made the political price too high to keep ground troops there. So that was a really good thing. But the other side of it is the, the drone war has been massively expanded. The air war has been massively expanded. And the special operations have been massively expanded. And all that goes on without very much consequence for anybody here at home. You know, you don't have body bags coming back to the US but you have more and more and more people dying in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Iraq. There's now 3,100 troops back in Iraq, ground troops. You know, we keep hearing, no boots on the ground. Oh, okay, so they wear sneakers, that makes it okay? Because they're sneaking around without us knowing? I mean, this is, this is insane. This is really dangerous. This is secret war on steroids that we're dealing with. And I think that what we have to deal with here is a, a recognition that the Middle East is a mess. The region is a mess. There is no question about it. And there are plenty of indigenous reasons, starting with repressive governments backed by the US for three or four generations, backed by oil companies for five generations, and backed by absolute monarchs for six generations, all of whom have violated the human rights of their populations for far too many generations. So that's a big chunk of it. But our policy is responsible for a huge amount of that crisis. And that's the part we have to change. That's the part that we have to do something different. So what I thought I would do today, because you all are experienced activists, and I say that with all due respect that I'm not only talking about age here, but because I know the work of these organizations. You guys have been doing this a long time. I don't need to go through all the details. I will in questions. I'm glad to take whatever questions you want about sort of the, the details in the region. But I thought what I would do instead is to talk about what we need to be doing, what we need to be demanding. We heard just now in the introduction that this is a moment where we need to change the system. That means, among other things, for us, that you know, focusing on war policy and peace policy, we need an entirely different framework for our political understanding of what foreign policy looks like, for what war and peace look like, for all those things. So I'm going to go through some ideas about what we have to be advocating for, because it's not enough to just say, stop the war against terror. <clears throat> OK, and then what? Because people, for good reasons and bad reasons, still demand, what are we going to do about it? Now, the good reason is, that people are inherently, until they're you know, educated out of it, start out, I think, as internationalists, as humans. So people care about what happens to people in other parts of the world, even if they're not Americans, even if they're not citizens, even if they're not white. What a concept. Instinctively, people care about other people. So that's <clears throat> part of if I talk really quietly like this, can you still hear me? Yes. yes. I have two more, com two more panels this afternoon, and I, I really have to be careful here. If part of, what we're, part of what we're looking for is a sense of how do we make those changes. So there's good reasons why people are demanding answers beyond just don't go to war, stop the global war on terror, because they don't want people to be abandoned to the ravages of a horrific organization like ISIS, for instance, which is really a terrible organization. Pretty much everything, not, not quite everything, but pretty much everything you read about it is true. It is awful. And for people living under it, it is horrific. So it's legitimate and important and appropriate that we say, well, what do we do to help those people? The bad reason that people demand answers is that we were given a lesson on September 12th, 2001. You know, a lot of people think the world changed on September 11th. I don't think so. September 11th was a huge crime. There's no question about it. Huge crime against humanity. But it did not change the world. It did not threaten the existence of our republic. 
what threatened our republic and continues to, what threatens the world then and now, was what happened on September 12th when George Bush announced that the response to September 11th was going to be to take the world to war. So we have to look at what happened on September 12th, which among other things, was the President of the United States speaking at a moment of incredible existential fear among the American people, which was absolutely understandable. It had been before the living memory of anyone alive in this country that there had been a foreign attack of this magnitude on the United States. It had never happened in the, in the lifetime of anyone who was alive in 2001. You know, when Pearl Harbor was hit, uh, Hawaii was not a city. It wasn't on the territory of the United States. We had never had an attack like this. So it's understandable. People were terrified. And people would have followed any leadership. The leadership we got gave us a stark choice. We either go to war or we let them get away with it. And letting get away with it didn't seem like such a great option. So way too many people who should have known better understandably said, well, maybe we need more, and supported that war. That was what we faced in 2001. And the consequences of that war, the continuation of that war, is what we are looking at today. The problem is that choice was wrong. There's never only the choice of war or nothing. It's the same problem we face now when people say, we can't just stand back and let ISIS ravage. Right. So let's look at what are the choices when we hear the debate in Congress, we're debating the authorization for the use of military force. No, you're not. You're debating the terms of what should be in the authorization. What happened? Why didn't we have a debate on whether we should authorize military force? Nobody suggested that. We were only arguing about the details. That's where we come in. That's where we have to be very serious about recognizing that there are alternatives. And, we have, and I want to say one other thing before I get to the alternatives. And that is that we also have to recognize that there are limits to what we can accomplish. Being the most powerful, the wealthiest, the militarily strongest country in the world does not make us all-powerful. It does not mean that our all-powerful army has the power to make right the horrific realities of some people's lives. So one of those realities, for example, is at the moment that ISIS is on the border of your town, is bombing them going to solve the problem? Almost inevitably, the answer is no, when we're talking about US bombing. Number one, because it's never as precise as they claim, and it's going to kill a lot of innocent people. Number two, the quote, right people they may kill have families and sons and daughters and parents and villages and clans and tribes and communities and ethnic groups and religious groups that are going to be outraged by what you're doing, regardless of what that individual person may have done or threatened to do. Which in the very close medium term, let alone the long term, is going to make it worse. So we, so we have to recognize that sometimes there is nothing we can do that is going to answer an immediate crisis with an immediate solution. You know, the US, just to give you one example, when the US went to war in Afghanistan in, in 2001, starting October 7th, one of the things that happened with this massive bombing raids that began all across Afghanistan, people fled to the mountains, and they fled with nothing, carrying their children in the, you know, the snows were, were already coming, October in Afghanistan was already winter. It was very, very cold. They had no food, often no water. It was a desperate humanitarian catastrophe. And the US was under pressure to do something. Look what, look what your bombing is, is creating. It's creating a humanitarian catastrophe. And they said, not to worry. We will ride to the rescue. Or in this case, we will fly to the rescue. We're going to drop food by helicopter and by plane. And the experienced aid workers were like, no, please don't do that. Number one, it never works very well. You lose a huge amount of the food. It doesn't go to the right places. Most of the planes can't take off. And it takes 35, 75, 150 times more amounts of money to do that than it does if you do it the slower, reliable way using trucks and donkeys. So get over your grandiose ideas about the Air Force and do it, please, our way. We're the United States. We don't do donkeys. 
So they did planes. So what happens? They send up planes with these massive pallets of food wrapped in bright yellow plastic so they're, they're visible, right? And starting number one, the food is obviously familiar to every Afghan. It's focused around peanut butter. Very familiar to every Afghan. But not to worry because instructions about what the food is is written in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. <laughs> Very useful in Afghan. But then, the, the comedy turns to horror. Because at the same time, and in some areas the same place, that they're dropping food wrapped in bright yellow plastic, they're dropping cluster bombs that are made with the same bright yellow plastic. And about 30% of cluster bombs don't explode when they're supposed to. They just drop to the ground and they become landmines. So if you look at what's happening these days in today, in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, where children continue to be killed, adults continue to be maimed by landmines suddenly exploded because a farmer steps on them. Or a children thinks it's a toy and grabs it and pulls at it and it explodes and kills a child. It goes on every day, every day, every day in these countries. The same thing is happening in Afghanistan. And there was enough of an outrage about it that there was a big press conference. And the press asked General Richards, who was then the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, you know, the impolite version, I won't say it, but was essentially WTF. Are you doing? And he said, well, <laughs> and then the question was, well, are you going to stop? And the answer was, we will stop when we use up those that are already in the pipeline. And then they went on national radio in Afghanistan in three languages saying, attention people of Afghanistan, the coalition of nations are dropping food, drop, dropped in, in bright yellow packages. And we, um, in some areas, are also dropping cluster bombs on the enemy, whoever that might be, <laughs> that might look the same. So we urge you to be careful. Oh, okay. And everybody, of course, who had fled into the mountains with nothing, had a radio and nothing better to do than listen to. <laughs> so this is what happens. This is what happens when you have the, the arrogance, the chutzpah, to think that you know better and have power beyond that of anyone else. So, having said all of that about the grim stuff, this is a moment of pretty bad uh, dangers, but also opportunity. And one last point about our moment, which is Iran. On the Iran agreement, we have a moment of opportunity and a moment of danger. So the opportunity is, Yay, they really did agree to an interim agreement that went really far. It looks really good. It could really be the basis for a permanent agreement that would deal with Iran's nuclear program, which is a nuclear power program. It would keep it that way. It would reduce significantly the stockpile of uh, both low, low enriched uranium that Iran has and the little bit of medium uranium enriched uranium that they have. You know, uranium can be enriched at pretty much any level. To be used for a weapon, it has to be up in the 90 to 95 percent range. To run a nuclear power plant, <coughs> bad as those are, they are unfortunately legal under inter international law. That's our next job, to stop that. But it is legal. That needs to be only about three and a half percent enriched. And Iran has enriched a lot of that. They have a big stockpile of it. They use it for you know, this, this um, uh, uh, nuclear power plant that was, we should note, why do they have it? They're swimming in oil. Well, back in the 70s, under the Shah of Iran, when he was our guy, the US said, you need nuclear power. And the Iranians said, what are you, nuts? We're sitting in a sea of oil. Why would you want nuclear power? The US said, no, no, you need to diversify. Now, why was that? It was because Westinghouse wanted to sell them this giant reactor. What an interesting point. But nonetheless, they have this big reactor. So they use this low enriched uranium. They have been running it for years. But it would take away a lot of that stockpile, which is good because it can be pretty dangerous. And it would take away their entire stockpile of medium uranium, which is enriched to 20%, which is what you need for medical isotopes, for you know, radiation, for cancer, and that sort of thing. So in that context, you have a scenario of a really good possible agreement. 
with all six countries that are negotiating with Iran and Iran on the same page, yes, they're defining it with different details for their domestic audiences. Both Tehran and Washington <coughs> have right-wing, hardline nut jobs trying to scuttle it. But I've got to say, right now, the hardline, right-wing nut jobs in Washington are a far greater risk to the agreement than the hardline nut job right-wingers in Tehran. Mostly because the uh, the, the uh, supreme leader in Iran, uh, Ayatollah, Ali, ooh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, is calling them to account and basically telling them to shut up while the negotiations proceed. We don't quite have that level of discipline here. So there's a real danger. We have that opportunity. We have that opportunity. We also have the danger that it might be scuttled. The resolution that is pending in Congress that will give Congress the right to take a look at it could scuttle the negotiations. Because what it does, it doesn't make it impossible for the, for the agreement to go forward. But if the leadership in Iran is facing a growing amount of political pressure, which so far they're not, but if they are, it gives them the excuse of why they don't want to sign on. Because they could perfectly legitimately say, why should we sign on to this when the US Congress is saying, we may or may not allow it to go forward. Why should we make concessions when the other side is saying, we're not even sure we're going to abide by it? That's why it's so dangerous. So a crucial, immediate, short-term, tactical, narrow, not a victory but necessary to go forward with anything else task that we all have is to mobilize for an opposition vote to that resolution. Now, there are people in this state, like Ben Cardin, who should know better, who's in the lead on this thing. So you guys need to really hold him to account. Uh, they're on a break right now, I think, Congress, right? Isn't that right? Yeah. He's here. Call his office. Demand meetings. Every one of your separate organizations looks bigger that way. Take the clergy with you. Looks legitimate that way. Go meet with the, with the editorial boards of every <coughs> local paper in, in Washington, in, in Maryland, when you do it. Write letters to the editor and use Cardin's name in it. That guarantees he'll see it because, you know, the first thing they do in the office in the morning is Google the name of their boss and make sure that they know what the, what the uh, uh, publicity has been. So that's a really important uh, point for just this moment. So having taken way too much time on all of this, <coughs> Let me go through, I think it's eight points that I have, nine maybe, about what we need to be pushing for as alternatives to war in the Middle East. It's a mess, what do we do? So, step number one, go back to the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. That means make real the notion that there is no military solution. We hear that over and over and over again from political leaders, from President Obama, to members of Congress, to God knows who. Everybody says that. And yet the only response that they are putting real attention to, real money, real boots on the ground, if you will, is the military option. That's the only one. All the rest is talk. They're talking the talk of, we need diplomacy, we need negotiations, we need humanitarian aid, we need this, we need that. But they're walking the walk of the military. So point number one is first, do no harm, stop the airstrike, because it's making stuff worse and not better. All of this is based on the notion that's very simple. You can't bomb extremism. You can bomb extremists, and sometimes you might hit them. <coughs> more often, you're going to hit people around them and give them more credibility while you do it. But that's going to exacerbate and perpetuate a cycle of violence that's going to make things worse and not better in the very close in medium term. You can't bomb extremism out of existence. Number two, make real this notion of no boots on the ground. We hear it like a mantra. So on the one hand, it's got to be people like us who say, that's right, but let's deconstruct it a little bit. Let's look at why do we say that. Why is that such a goal? If we're not saying wars, if we're not saying the war is wrong. If we're saying war is okay if we don't have boots on the ground, what we're saying is that blood lost, lives lost, children lost is, be, is okay if it's not Americans. That's straight up racism. That's straight up xenophobia. 
if people are Arabs or Muslims or don't live here, it's okay to kill them, really? That's what that says. So number one, we have to challenge it. Number two, we have to challenge the idea that that's what they're doing. There are at least 3,100 pairs of boots on the ground right now. That's what they've told us, that that's what they've sent back to Iraq. We don't know how many pairs of CIA and JSOC sneakers are on the ground in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Yemen. Well, Afghanistan, no, Afghanistan has 11,000 troops on the ground officially right now, and who knows how many others unofficially. So, you want to say no boots on the ground? Okay, let's do that. Let's not lie about it, which is what they're doing now. This is also what organizations like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, like the Al-Nusra Front, this is what they want. They want our troops in their territory, on their turf, where they are strongest, both ideologically, to prove their point that the West is trying to overthrow and colonize their societies, their culture, their religion. It's like, sure we are. Look at our troops. What do you think they're there for? And it gives them targets. If we're not there, what are they going to go up against? Their own governments? Yeah. But if we're not there, their governments are going to look way different. And maybe they won't be so unpopular. So that's number two. Withdraw the troops, make real the commitment to no boots on the ground. Number three, stop flooding the region with arms. As long as the Middle East remains the most overarmed region in the world, we have no hope of ending the wars that go on there. You know, look what happened in Libya after the, the overthrow of Gaddafi. Take away the morality, take away the international law violations, take away the violations of the UN Charter and the UN resolutions. Just look at the consequences. Throwing open the doors of every arms, every arms depot in the country. Where are those arms today? They're in Mali, they're in Chad, they're in Algeria, they're in Iraq, they're in Syria, they're in Yemen. That's where these groups are getting their arms because they are flooding out of the once secure arms depots all across the region. Now, the other side of it is, if we're serious about pushing countries like Russia and Iran that are arming the Syrian regime, why do we think we, have, we would have any success, any credibility, if we're continuing to flood the rest of the region with arms to use against them? Let's just be pragmatic about it and say if we want an end to the arms coming in on all sides, let's start with our own. Now, let's be clear. This is the hardest one of all. Because the interests, the economic interests, of the CEOs and shareholders of Boeing, of McDonnell Douglas, of General Electric, of DynCorp, of all these companies, is bound up with permanent war. War profiteering is an ancient and much loved and very popular uh, uh, power center in the United States. So when we look at what do we do to challenge arms deals, we have to be very concrete. We have to go down and dirty and look at whose interests are being served when the US gives Saudi Arabia a $60 billion arms deal, as it did two years ago. Five years, $60 billion, the largest arms deal in the history of the world. So why are we surprised that right now Saudi Arabia has launched this incredibly devastating military attack on Yemen, which is creating a level of humanitarian crisis in Yemen that is parallel to what we've already been seeing for the last four years in Syria, only it's done it in four weeks instead of four years. You know, Yemen is a very small country, but with a population of 26 million people, of whom almost a quarter are already displaced. And on top of it, they have bombed the airports so aid shipments can't arrive. This is a country that depends for 90% of its food on imports. So this is the consequence of us being so profligate with our arms. But look who those powerful lobbies are. Look what we're up against. So we have to be very uh, concrete about that. One aspect means we have to demand enforcement of the Leahy Law. The Leahy Law says, 
that it is illegal under U.S. law, this doesn't even look at international law, <coughs> we are obligated under U.S. law to refuse to send arms <coughs> or to sell arms to any military unit, a small unit or a whole national army, that has a pattern and practice of human rights violations. Yeah, Saudi Arabia, you think so? But, like all of these things, there's a little exemption in it that says right. the president can waive it if it's required for national security. Oh, okay. So that's what happens to Israel. That's what happens to Saudi Arabia. Qatar, Jordan, Kuwait, the UAE. All these countries are massive violators of human rights. You just look at the State Department's report every year. They just issued it a week or so ago, this year's. Every year they do reports on these countries' violations of international law. Hmm and human rights. And every year there are massive violations documented, even Israel. They document it every year and then they say, but don't worry, we're not going to do anything about it. Yeah. The same with Saudi Arabia. This is the challenge that we face on the issue of arms. Number four, these are in no particular order. We need a campaign to reverse a very important and incredibly damaging and dangerous Supreme Court uh, um, Decision, that's the word I'm looking for. A Supreme Court decision, not United, United, uh, Citizens United, the most important damaging one, but another one called Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. Mm -hmm. Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project basically says that it is illegal, it is a crime for anyone in the United States, anyone in the State Department, any ambassador, or any person to provide to any organization on the U.S. list of so-called foreign terrorist organizations, information on things like, and it spells them out, nonviolence training, accessing the United Nations human rights system. Um, what are some of the others? Those are my two favorites. It's a host of other alternatives to violence. It is illegal. If I go to Gaza, it is illegal for me to meet with Hamas officials as officials, I mean, if they happen to be in an audience, maybe it's not prosecutable. I maybe would take the risk, maybe not. But you know what I mean? But officially, if I meet, if I go to a Hamas office to offer a <laughs> seminar in how, instead of using rockets ever, they could make political gains by accessing the UN human rights system in a new way, that would be illegal. That would be a crime. If I went to well, the example was the Humanitarian Law Project in, uh, in Turkey, which is an A group that is on the U.S. list of foreign terrorist organizations. And if I went there and said, I'd be prepared to offer nonviolence training to some of your activists. So if they do another uh, um, flotilla to Gaza, they will have nonviolence training to rely on when Israeli commandos from helicopters jump onto the ship and start shooting people. That would be a crime. That would be illegal. We need to stop this list, number one. We need to stop criminalizing the provision of nonviolent alternatives to anybody, anybody in the world. Number five, we need real new diplomacy on how to deal with ISIS. We keep saying there's no military solution, so let's start emphasizing the diplomatic solutions, the negotiated solutions, especially with Iran especially with Iran. The nuclear talks should be the first step, not the last step, towards a real normalization, a real grand bargain with Iran, to start figuring out on a regional level how are we going to deal with ISIS. Iran is on the same side as the U.S. on ISIS. ISIS is a, is a great threat to Iran, as is Al-Qaeda, for some good reasons and some bad reasons. You know, if you look at what happened right after 9-11, Iran was the closest ally of the United States in the process of creating an alternative government in Afghanistan to take power after the U.S. overthrew the Taliban. Why? Because Al-Qaeda was a huge enemy of Iran. So in that context, Iran and the U.S. were collaborating very, very closely. It was a great book, I'm just trying to remember the guy's name, who was the U.S. Uh, envoy, the special envoy of the Bush administration to those talks in, in Germany. Uh, they would come to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. But he wrote a book about the role that Iran played as our greatest ally. And what was the response of the Bush administration to that great collaboration? 
that lasted through the period of the overthrow of the Taliban, to call Iran part of the axis of evil. Oh, that was really helpful. Because at that point, the Iranians said, you know, we don't need this. You know, we ain't getting no respect from you. We need something better. And they pulled back. And, you know, re relations have not been so good since. <coughs> so we need new diplomacy on, on ISIS. Number six, we need new diplomatic and uh, negotiating initiatives that look at both the, the whole broad question of interna the international role on the Syria-ISIS crisis that's underway across the region. That means supporting the UN on the creation of short-term truces in Syria that are underway. It means pushing the UN to say, look, there have been two efforts to appoint UN special envoys to Syria. They both failed, in my view, mostly because they didn't get any support from the Security Council, particularly from the United States. They both resigned in frustration. That doesn't mean you throw up your hands and say, well, sorry about that, Syria, you're on your own. It means you try again. You know, when, when you fail twice, you try again. Maybe the, the third time will, will work. You support the envoy. You make real efforts to bring together the kinds of negotiations that it's going to take to really end this horrifying civil war. That means everybody has to be at the table. Why did the Geneva talks fail this round? For a bunch of reasons, but one of the reasons was the U.S. refusal to allow Iran to be at the table. What were they thinking? You don't negotiate with people you like. You don't need to. You negotiate with the other side. So the U.S. says, Iran is part of the problem. We're not going to allow them at the table. Well, first of all, who the hell gives you the right to say who's at the table? That's number one, but that doesn't ever get you very far in Washington, at least. Number two is a lesson that was learned by former Senator George Mitchell when he negotiated the Good Friday Agreements in, in Northern Ireland. He said the first thing you have to remember is if you're serious about diplomacy, everybody has to be at the table. You can't leave out somebody because you think they were terrorists. Because it's not because you like them and suddenly they're not terrorists. They may still be terrorists. They may still be terrible people. You may still hate them. Go ahead, hate them, who cares? But if they're not there, they're not bound by what you decide. So you're giving them an excuse to undermine the result. You're setting yourself up to fail. You're guaranteeing your own failure. You're guaranteeing your own failure. So why bother having negotiations at all? So that's what we have to keep coming back to. Iran has to be at the table. Now, they're obviously not the only ones that have to be at the table. You also need every Syrian party and all their regional backers. So you need the Syrian regime. You need the armed opposition, whatever form it's taking these days, both the secular and Islamist opposition, all of whom are pretty compromised in a bunch of ways. But hey, they, they are who they are. They're part of this. If they're not there, it's not going to work. You need the representatives of Syrian civil society, including the nonviolent political protesters that launched the Arab Spring in Syria women's organizations, the representatives of refugees, Syrian, Palestinian, others who have been dis dispossessed. You need all of the minority communities, the Alawites, the, the, the Druze, the Christians, uh, the Kurds, the Sunni, uh, the, the Shia, all of the minority communities in Syria have to be represented, and all of their regional sponsors. So you need Saudi Arabia, you need Jordan, you need Turkey. Everybody's got to be at the table, because otherwise it's just not going to work. Number seven, we have to escalate the pressure that's already underway to stop U.S. support for Israeli occupation and apartheid. Now, in the context of the crisis in the region, this isn't the first thing that comes up when you look at what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Yemen. But one bit below the surface, the question of Palestine remains fundamental across the region. So all of that has to be challenged. It goes to the question of the credibility of the United States in the region. A big part of the reason that nobody believes the United States whenever it says anything is because of 60 years of uncritical support for Israeli aggression. We have a moment of opportunity. President Obama said just a couple of weeks ago that maybe it's time to rethink whether we should continue to provide Israel uncritical support in the United Nations. Now, I frankly don't think that that's an indication that he's going to do it this round. But the fact that he said it is unprecedented. The fact that the President of the United States actually said that maybe uncritical support 
that, in, that guarantees Israeli impunity, that guarantees that no Israeli official, political or military, will ever be held accountable for potential war crimes in the United Nations, in the International Criminal Court, or anywhere else. The fact that maybe we should rethink that is an absolutely unprecedented reality. We need to build on that. We have become mainstream on this issue. This is where we got to get out of the church basements. You know, the, the churches are taking the lead. The mainstream uh, Protestant denominations, particularly the Methodists and the Presbyterians, have taken the lead on boycott resolutions, on considering sanctions resolutions, that are saying Israeli policy is not acceptable and it doesn't match our beliefs as Christians. For the faith-based community, that's huge. Because these are not rogue elements within the church. And frankly, this isn't the Unitarians. This isn't the Mennonites. These aren't the historic peace churches. This is Hillary Clinton's church. We are mainstream, and we damn well have to start acting like it. We have to start demanding our place at the table. Without being defensive, without feeling like, oh, God, we've got APAC on the other side. How can we ever compete? Well, you know what? APAC right now is being vicious on <coughs> campuses, not because they feel empowered and can do whatever they want. They are desperately afraid. Why are they afraid? Because when they meet, if we take out this side of the room, their meetings look like this side of the room, absent a couple of African Americans. If they look white and old, <laughs> emphasis on the old part, old Jews are supporting APAC, old rich Jews. Young Jews are saying, APAC, really? You think I'm part of that? And organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace that stands for divestment sanctions, this is the, the voice of the future. And this is why APAC is so nervous. Because they don't have the influence of the youth. And they're terrified. I've got to say, when I was growing up, a young Jewish kid in California, we didn't have any choices. It was APAC. That's what we did. We were APAC and proud, right? We didn't know any better. There wasn't any alternative. What these kids have now, oh my god, they make me proud. It's, it's just fantastic to watch them in motion. They're creative, they're smart. They have no, no patience with old-fashioned, you know, slow-going, boring kind of activities. They want funny, creative, new stuff, flash mobs, whatever. It's fantastic. So that's number seven. Number eight is we have to increase the amount of money, specifically money, the U.S. spends on humanitarian aid. Now right now the U.S. is pledging more than any other country. It's not more than the European Union as a whole, but it is the biggest. Okay, that's a good thing. But relative to our share of the global economy, it's not close to what it should be. It is shameful. It is shameful. And if we spent one day's worth we are spending $2 billion a day on the global war on terror. If we spent one day's worth for six months on the humanitarian crisis in Syria and in the countries surrounding Syria as a result of the Syria crisis and a little bit pushed over into Yemen, the possibilities of saving lives in an immediate sense and the possibility of reducing the level of violence would be qualitatively different, qualitatively different. So we have to look, stop letting them get away with what we're supporting more than any other. That's not the standard. The standard is what should we be paying and where should it come from? It should come from the Pentagon. Enough of this, enough. It should come out of the Pentagon budget and go straight to the United Nations. So when they say, well, we don't have any money, you damn straight have the money. You're just wasting it. So that's what we have to focus on. All right, so those are my eight points. The final point I wanted to raise, and this is particular to Maryland and to Baltimore. What we have to do, this isn't about what we have to demand for what our country should do. This is about what we need to do and where we need to be. We need to be where people are in motion demanding justice. The peace movement as self-defined has always been limited. It's understandable why. Who has the time in their day, the privilege, if you will, <coughs> to work on issues that don't affect them directly? 
it's people who tend to be not affected by the worst ravages of society. In the main, it tends to be, in this society, white, middle class, and older. We can joke about that. It's not a joke. It's not a bad thing. But we have to confront it and say, OK, what do we do about that? What do we do about the fact that, in the main, we don't have young people here, and we don't know how to reach them. So part of it is, sometimes we're going about it the wrong way. We're, we're saying, we have these events, and we put up flyers, and yet people don't come. OK, where are we on Facebook, number one? Where are we on Twitter? Where are we on Instagram? OK, I say that when I don't even know how Instagram works. <laughs> but I do, know, I do know Facebook and Twitter. I'm there. But it's not only that. Part of it is we have to stop this notion of how do we get them to come to us and start thinking about how do we go to where they are. Like today, there's going to be a huge march in Baltimore. Thankfully, it's a little bit celebratory. At least it's a little bit of relief. At least there's going to be a modicum. <coughs> a modicum of justice, that at least the police have been indicted for the murder of Freddie Gray. At least that. At least that. It's not enough. That's not justice. But the beginnings of accountability are crucial for the fight for justice. We need to be there partly to express solidarity with the communities that face the wrath of police on a daily basis which is all about class and race and the intersection of class and race. And it's about militarism. Why is it that police agencies across this country, police departments in cities and counties across this country, including in Maryland, are armed with stuff that belongs on a war zone, with guns that are appropriate to a war zone, with armored personnel carriers, on our streets, when we're told that we don't have enough money for jobs programs, when we're closing after school programs in poor neighborhoods for kids to play basketball instead of selling drugs, where we're closing schools because we don't have enough money, where are we getting the money to buy armored personnel carriers, for God's sakes? Well, the, here's the tricky part. The answer is, and we have to be prepared for this, we're not paying for those, we get them free. Really, we get them free? They're just on like a parking lot and you just go say, oh, well, I'll have one in blue and one in black? This is what the Pentagon is doing with their leftover equipment <coughs> from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our so-called allies are so unreliable that the US was not willing to leave equipment in their hands, so they spent billions and are still spending billions of our money to airlift home and ship home things like armored personnel carriers and tanks and armored trucks and RPGs and God knows what else. And what do they do with it back home? They offer it up as a gesture of generosity to local police agencies. Wow. Talk about the militarization of our streets. Now we're not going up against the bad guys in Afghanistan. We're going up against the bad guys in Baltimore. Who are the bad guys in Baltimore? Kids hanging out on a street in West Baltimore. Why are they hanging out there? Well, some of them because the basketball court was closed. Because we don't have any money. So these are issues that we, as activists committed to demilitarizing our society, need to be bringing to where people are in motion demanding justice <coughs> for Freddie Gray. <clears throat> that's where we belong. So that's the other part of the 